To the Bold Alone, welcome back. Tonight we continue book two of the Civil Land series, Crystal Eyes, with chapter three, Prayer's Passage. I hope you're ready for an exciting one. I hope you're ready to head out west. It's going to get wild. So get your pistols ready and saddle up. As always, I'm your host, Nicholas Austin. This is Tuesday Night Fiction. Let's begin. With his legs kicked up on a footrest and a tall mug of thick, dark beer by his side, Gregory Calloway found a minute to relax in the study of the Keegan Mansion. The weeks following William's departure for New Berkeley had been stressful for Gregory. Not only was he now the man of the house in the mansion, but he was also essentially the man of the whole operation in the Marietta. Leading others was not a role he had ever taken on before. And as much as he was willing to bite the bullet for William, he couldn't say he particularly liked the responsibility. He also knew a moment like this one was a rare, peaceful escape for him in the time until the eldest Keegan returned. After taking a long swig of beer and scratching his fuzzy, balding head, Gregory eased back into his cozy armchair. He closed his eyes, immersing himself in the calming darkness of his mind. A small fist slams sharply into the side of his upper arm. Ow! What the f heck? Gregory caught himself in his language when he spotted it was the young Donna Keegan who had punched him in his arm. William wouldn't tolerate Gregory teaching his cousin any foul words while he was away. Donna, my goodness, you can't go around punching people who are trying to sleep and have done nothing wrong to you. This time he spoke in an intentionally less fiery manner. The look on Donna's face showed no remorse. She appeared furious. What is it you want, dear? The compassion and calm Gregory was trying to show Donna appeared to be having little effect. Her face turned bright red, and she stomped her foot on the ground. She looked like a plump, angry tomato. Over the past few months, Gregory had begun to notice Donna appeared to be getting a bit chunkier, and this was yet another cause of stress. He didn't want to allow the girl to balloon while her brother and cousins were away, but also had no idea how to tell a young girl she needed to stop eating and lose weight. As Gregory's thoughts wandered off, Donna stomped again. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, he said, recalling Donna's inability to speak without her brother speaking first. Well, if you have something to say, where's Blanton? She gave him a sarcastic look, first folding her arms in frustration and then lifting her palms upward as she shrugged her shoulders. So, you can't find him? Donna dramatically reared an arm back behind her. Gregory was confused by this, and worried she might punch him again, but like a rocket, she shot a thumb up right in front of his nose. It was as if somehow this girl thought it was obvious what she wanted, even though she didn't speak a word. Being around the children in the Keegan mansion did at least ease Gregory's despair about no longer having a child of his own. Well, why didn't you say so? He joked to get back at her. Her expression went completely blank and irritated. Oh, don't get upset, I was only kidding. Let's go find your brother. As he went to sit up in his chair, Donna let out a friendly smile. Another punch landed sharply in his arm again. Ah, stop doing that, damn it! He bellowed. He got up from his spot and Donna merrily skipped to the door. Once William comes back, and your brother Walter too, I swear. Donna stopped in her tracks and turned to face him, raising her eyebrows. Forget it, Gregory said, moving past her into the hallway. With Donna at his back, Gregory marched through the mansion, searching and calling for her brother Blanton, who was nowhere to be found. They went to his room first, the library next, then through the living rooms and dining room, but they could not find him anywhere. When they went to check outside, Gregory spotted Maria Abigail, the mother of William's wife Judith, gardening as her young children played. He took note of Francis, Henrietta, and Florence, but still no Blanton. Excuse me, Miss Abigail. Have you seen Blanton anywhere? Gregory called out. Maria put down her tools. Gregory, by now you should be calling me Maria. 
I don't look old to you, do I? Not at all, ma'am. Gregory embarrassingly stuttered as he approached her. You're a perfectly beautiful lady. Maria smiled at him and Gregory felt relieved. I'm only teasing, but thank you for the compliment. Maria chirped as she rose off her knees and to her feet. Now what's this business with Glenn? As much as he was trying to be polite, Gregory also meant the words he'd said to Maria. While the color in her hair was beginning to fade, she wore her beauty well, and there was an infectious charm about her. Besides, she wasn't too much older than him. I'm looking for Blanton on behalf of Donna here, who's got something to say, and I'd prefer for her to say so without punching me in the arm again, as she's insisted on doing. He shot a look at Donna, who stuck out her tongue at him. No need to fret, darling. If there's one thing we women can do better than any man, it's finding things that are hidden away. Well, now that I think of it, things that aren't hidden too, for that matter. Gregory chuckled and followed her as she marched inside with purpose. Once again, they walked through all of the same rooms, with Maria scanning every corner. Still, Gregory saw nothing and was beginning to worry that the boy was not in the mansion at all. Donna, could you please check Francis, Henrietta, and Florence's rooms for me, please? Maria asked. Donna nodded and darted off, clearly desperate. Once she was gone, Maria leaned close to Gregory. Blanton is in the dining room, underneath the table, hiding behind the tablecloth. I didn't want to alert Donna because I think he wants some alone time, but maybe you could go talk him out of it while she's distracted? It wasn't entirely surprising that Maria was so sharp, but Gregory was still taken aback. I will. Thanks for your help, he smiled. Maria winked back, and Gregory returned again to the dining room. When he arrived, he eased his way over to the table. Blanton, I know you're under there, he called. I'm not going to pull up the cloth, but I just want to talk to you. It's just us, okay? I promise. Are you sure? Blanton murmured. Gregory felt relief overcome him that Blanton was safe, but it almost simultaneously sunk to the ground as Donna came barging into the room. Blanton! She shrieked. Only now able to speak after hearing Blanton. I heard you! I know you're there! Come out now! No, Donna! Gregory started, but it was too late. Blanton popped out of his hiding place and ran for the door. It seemed to Gregory that as Donna had gained weight, Blanton had lost weight. And seeing him in this state, running and hiding for some privacy, Gregory felt terrible for the boy. You lied to me! Blanton cried as he turned to Gregory. I hate you! Blanton, stop it! Calm down! Donna reached a hand onto his arm. But I didn't mean to, Gregory started. Before he could finish though, Blanton was out of the dining room with Donna racing after him. As they left, in came Maria looking upset. I'm so sorry, Gregory, she said. She got away, and I know he didn't mean what he said. It's okay, Gregory mumbled, not necessarily believing it would be and feeling like a failure. William will be back soon enough. That'll do it for part one of what will be two tonight. We've just met William's friend Gregory Calloway, his best friend since coming to the Marietta Territory. Much more to find out about him as well as the hijinks between William's cousins, Blanton and Donna. But for now, let's continue on. A time will come when you'll have to make a choice, William. Between the relentless pursuit of your burning passions and your dedication to those who you love the most, only then will you understand how difficult it is, no matter which path you might choose. Only then will you understand my choice. The words of his father Leonard had echoed in his mind since the day William had left New Berkeley for the Murrieta. Now, as his posse traveled towards Prayer's Passage on their way back east, the statement seemed to ring even louder. His only relief from the stress of his desire for his father's elusive approval were two beauties the Murrieta landscape and his wife, Judith. After leaving Fayette, William was pleased to see each sunrise reveal more magnificence than the last. As the spring set in, blue bonnets came to line the open, hilly fields they passed through, and the scent of the flowers filled the air. Smelling sweet, they reminded him of Judith, prompting him to look at her as she slept in the wagon. And he thought about how she'd been his comfort and support through this entire venture. Following the successful upheaval of the Riverlands, 
Their travels east had been delayed by particularly harsh winter conditions. When the day had finally come to leave, William's nerves had begun to set in, but Judith had pulled him through it. The memory was crisp and clear in his mind as he looked back out to the field of bluebonnets. With his necessities all packed and ready to go, William had felt paralyzed. Hands on his knees, eyes closed and head bowed, he sat on the edge of the bed wondering whether he could do this. An arm softly placed around him broke his concentration. Everything's going to be all right, William. Judith's hushed tone rang through his whole body as if it were ice pressed against his fevered skin. Her touch and the rosy punch of her perfume had brought him a welcome tranquility, as it always had from the moment he'd met his gorgeous, powerful wife. With each passing day since their wedding, William had become more familiar with her, especially in the days of their delayed travels. The two would have loud, passionate sex multiple times a day, which for William had been as much a matter of passing the time and relieving stress as it was an indication of his desire for Judith. Yet while her touch had soothed, it hadn't removed his fear. Now that you're here, my love, I know it is. William wanted to appease her. Don't you lie to me, she'd said. I know you, and I can see you don't truly believe it, but you need to. You need to not just for me, but for both of us. This is your moment, William. I know it, my father knows it, and your brothers know it too. If you don't, though, all that support and all your work will have been for nothing. Leonard will see the man you've become. He has to. And my father's connections with him will help solidify that. But even if he ends up being a fool and resisting the truth, this is our world, baby. This is and always will be our world. I promise you. William had meant it, too. Still feeling energized by the way his wife had spoken to him that day, he smiled down at her as she continued to doze in the wagon. He knew that together the world would be theirs. Admiring the landscape, William noticed the hills had begun to grow taller, and the grassy fields were substituted for dry, dirt-covered paths up ahead. Cassius indicated to William and the others they should be on high alert, as the shallow, canyon-like environment was an indication they had entered Prayer's Passage. The last time Cassius had been in the passage, he had been leading the Abigails to William. The landscape of the passage was somewhat familiar from William's first time venturing into the Murrieta, but it had been some time since. He recalled the atmosphere being unnerving at the time, but it was possibly even more haunting now in the spring. Given the eerie feeling permeating from the valley, the seasonal beauty only offered a discomforting illusion. With the thieves known as the Highlanders, and a population of coyotes, venomous reptiles, and other dangerous forms of wildlife. Nothing was safe about this place. Now, as Williams scanned in all directions, he thought the path felt too calm. To Williams' left was a shallow tributary of the Charisma, no wider than 50 feet across, but the occasional run-down home popping up on the other side every half mile or so. To his right were canyon-like cliffs raised high overhead. He wondered first how anyone could live in those homes across the waterway. Could conditions here have somehow improved since his last visit? Yet it also, in some way, felt intentional that the river separated the two sides. It was as if the residents knew something no one else did. Henry, Judith's father, pointed toward the base of the canyon wall. What is that? He called, squinting. Henry's leg was tapping rapidly and his eyes darted in every direction. He was nervous. Just off in the distance, William could spot two massive boars with powerful tusks. While they seemed to be grazing peacefully, they seemed to be aware of the wagon's presence and trotted along in the same direction as it. Those would be hogs, Cassius told Henry. We'll keep an eye on them and take action should they get any closer. For now they're far enough off that they shouldn't be bothered by us, and so won't bother us in return. Over the next few hours, the ride through the passage was relatively quiet. A larger than average house soon appeared in the distance on the other side of the river. It was still less than half the size of the Keegan mansion, William thought, but it was noticeably different from the others. It had shutters painted a dark red around windows that were all either cracked or had outright holes in them. 
As they moved closer, William noted that the holes were in fact bullet holes, which were littered across the wooden walls. Between the house and the stream was a field with high stalks. Standing in the center, well above those stalks was a tall, disfigured scarecrow. The patchwork of the thing suggested to William it had been made and remade. Though the house appeared abandoned, the scarecrow seemed to have been stitched together recently. The hogs, which had been steadily moving alongside their party but keeping their distance, began snorting, catching William's attention. They seem agitated, he thought. But by what? A crackling sounded from the house, and in an instant, the scarecrow by the abandoned house went up in flames. The two horses leading the front of the wagon became startled, but Cassius was able to bring them to ease. What the hell is going on? Judith murmured, just as a shot burst through the air and ripped straight through the cover of the wagon. Judith screamed as William and Henry shielded her, pushing her down to the floor for safety. Highlanders! Cassius cried as he jostled the reins and called for the horses to pick up speed. William looked out the front but ducked down as three outlaws on horseback burst out from behind the house, slowing as they crossed the stream but continuing to fire their weapons. Each of the riders wore a cowboy hat and bandana that rested just below their eyes. Cassius dodged the first array of bullets from his left and fired back, hitting one of the Highlander's horses. It fell screaming into the water. They'll be at our backs in a second! Cassius screamed as they ran along the stream and passed the house on their left. Grab weapons and fire out the back once they're in sight! The others, Judith included, followed his command. As soon as they passed, each of the three fired. Every click of the trigger intensified William's high with the intensity of the moment. There were no hits, but as they reloaded, Cassius turned the wagon toward the stream. The move seemed insane to William. What the fuck are you doing? We won't lose them in this wagon. Our only choice is to shoot our way out of this. We'll take the house. As their horses dashed into the stream, water splashed up into the wagon. The rocky river floor caused the wagon to jolt violently in crossing, which made aiming at those in pursuit even more difficult. Judith, William, and Henry continued to fire sporadically for cover and continued to miss. By William's count, there were still at least four Highlanders after them. The two remaining up on their horses, the one who fired the first shot and was likely holed up in the house, and the one whose horse had fallen but who had survived the fall and was running back toward the house as well. He laughed hysterically and cheered at the rider's misfortune to have to double back across the stream yet again in the opposite direction. How clever Cassius was after all. There still could have been more in the home, but by his counting of their gunshot progression, it didn't seem likely. They soon emerged from the edge of the narrow, shallow stream, and Cassius rushed the horses toward the house. However, as they moved closer, two shots came from within it, one of which smashed through a spoke in one of the wheels, causing the wagon to collapse straight onto its side. Cassius was thrown off his perch, while William, Judith, and Henry were tossed around inside the wagon cover. William hit his head on the way down, and was left dazed as he tried to right himself. He realized there must be two men in the house after all. As he made it onto his knees, he spotted a frantic Cassius running over to him. Come on! We have to get to the side of the house for cover! Now! Grab the weapons and let's go! William nodded, but first he needed to ensure Judith was alright. She was crouched beside him. He brushed her hair away from her face and was surprised to see a smile alongside her already forming bruises. With a nod, she confirmed she was ready to run, and so they did. Just as William and Judith made it to cover behind the corner of the house, the Highlanders shot their pistols again. William's group was now at an angle that placed them out of the line of sight of the two Highlanders in the house, but the ones on horseback were not far behind them. They were just making their way back across the water now. As much as William liked to lead, being in the action was something he felt he could never grow out of. His blood was singing with the joy of it. William heard a gunshot and saw Henry, who had been sprinting toward them, fall to his knees just feet from the side of the house. Judith screamed as her father clutched the side of his head and struggled to get up. Daddy! Judith bellowed. William saw blood beginning to seep through Henry's fingers. He hastily analyzed his surroundings, knowing he needed to act. Give me your gun now, Judith, and stay here. Cassius, can you take care of the men inside? Cassius nodded and was off. 
William snatched the gun out of Judith's outstretched hand and ran directly toward Henry. With the revolver in his left hand, he fired upon the approaching riders as he slid to Henry's side. Luckily, he hit one of the Highlanders straight through the chest, knocking him off his horse and startling the other rider who circled back for his comrade. A bullet whizzed right past William, close enough that his ear began to ring. Once he realized he was still alive, he jolted around and emptied the revolver in his right hand at the house for cover. When it was emptied, he lifted Henry's pistol up off the floor. Where are you hit? I think they took a piece off my ear, Henry cried. Realizing he had only a few seconds before the second horseman returned and hearing no more movement from inside the house, William called for Judith's help. Judith, he called. Come here and get your father back to the house. Be quick about it. Judith rushed over as requested and lifted her father's arm over her shoulder. Once she had him, William darted behind the fallen wagon. The final Highlander on horseback soon made his return, barreling toward Judith and Henry at full speed. He fired, and William thought his heart might stop in his chest, but Judith and Henry reached the corner of the house just in time. When William felt the attacker was close enough to him, he jumped out of hiding and unloaded as rapidly as his pistol would fire. The smoke was thick and intoxicating as the bullets flew. When the air cleared, he realized that while he didn't hit the attacker directly, the horse had been struck multiple times and now lay collapsed on top of its rider. The Highlander wailed in pain as William marched over triumphantly. He was surprised to note this was a woman by the pitch of voice. Creeping into view of her exposed upper torso, he spotted a gun pointed up at him. Almost simultaneously, he dove out of sight as the pinned woman screamed, fired two shots, and kept clicking the trigger even after the weapon was empty. William jumped up to his feet, furious, and stormed around the horse to kick her pistol away. He placed his knee atop her neck and ripped the bandana off her face. The first thought that struck him was the woman was fairly attractive despite her aggressiveness. She appeared to be slightly younger than him, with jet black hair and green blue eyes that reminded him of the oceans of the Far East. He felt somewhat guilty for strangling her. When a helpless look crossed her face, it hit him. That, combined with a lack of resistance, led William to ease up off her neck. As he stood up, though, Judith came running over and kicked the woman in the face. You stupid bitch! She shrieked. She kicked the Highlander one more time and ran over to the discarded gun. Lifting it up, she stormed back over and pointed it at the defenseless woman's head. Her finger clicked the trigger two times, and when she realized it was out of ammo, she threw the weapon to the ground. At this point, her cheeks were similar in color to her red-brown hair, which she had to push out of her face. As much as William appreciated this side of his wife, he knew if they wanted to make it out of the passage without further interruption, they needed to stop this ruckus now. He wrapped Judith in his arms. Baby, please. She can't get away with this. They can't do this to the Keegans. They have to know who we are and respect our authority. William pointed down at the woman who was bloodied and breathing heavily. Look at her. Does it look like they've gotten away with this? Judith glared back at him in response. I know it's hard to accept, but taking this territory will need to happen one step at a time, and we'll take the army of men we're building. We can't have all the respect we deserve right now. Believe me, I'm just as impatient about it, but it's just the way it is. Looks like you missed a spot, motherfucker. The voice that sounded behind them was deep and raspy. William turned in horror to see what must have been the last Highlander limping toward them. His pistol aimed straight at William's chest. Two shots cracked through the sky. William instinctively braced himself and shut his eyes. When he opened them again, he was surprised to see the gunman shot dead. Looking toward the house, he spotted Cassius in the window with a rifle. Judith threw herself on him in tears. I'm alive, right? He gasped. You're damn right you are, Judith shrieked. Must have missed thanks to Cassius, Henry chimed in, walking up toward them. Cassius exited the house in short order and was approaching them with his rifle in one hand and a revolver in the other, the latter of which he tossed to William. Was that the last of them? Henry asked. William looked at Cassius, who nodded. 
I think so, William answered. At least I hope so. Either way, we need to get out of here as soon as possible. We've got three horses, two of ours and one of the Highlanders. We'll have to ride swiftly and make it the rest of the way to the Dorshar port without the wagon. Judith, you'll ride with... As he turned to address her, he found Judith several feet away from him, near the edge of the field of green stalks. She knelt down over the dead man's body, lifting his revolver out of his hand. There was no more use in trying to keep her from killing the Highlander woman, William supposed. William! He heard Cassius call. William looked up in time to see the two lumbering hogs that had been following them were now thundering toward him. Cassius fired the rifle, and luckily the bullet struck one of the hogs straight through the ribcage. The hog squealed relentlessly as blood spewed from it, but the second one only gained speed. With it upon him, William had no time to shoot before it tackled him to the ground, knocking the gun from his hand. As it swung its head to dig its tremendous tusks into him, he used both hands to grab them and hold it back. Recognizing his precarious position, he decided he'd need to make a move for a blade he had at his waist. With all his might, he held back the beast with his stronger right hand while reaching for his belt with the other. As he grabbed the handle of his weapon, though, he heard Cassius yelp in pain before firing off a second shot, presumably finishing the other hog, which must have managed to do some damage even with a bullet in its ribs. William's distraction caused his right hand to slip, and one of the tusks nicked the side of his face. Even as he screamed in pain, he began to stab at its stomach with his knife. William continued thrusting his blade furiously into the hog above him, until he was able to land a fatal last blow into its throat. For a moment, there was silence. Judith shouted, though, to break the calm. Drenched in the hog's blood, he prayed for the madness to end. Recognizing the irony of it, even as he begged whatever god there might or might not be for mercy. Prayer's passage indeed. Heaving the hog off him, he noticed Cassius standing across from him, a wound in his leg bleeding heavily. Even so, his rifle was aimed at a stranger who was holding Judith at gunpoint. Oh boy, what a chapter. What a wild and anything but regular Western shootout. Thanks for listening in as always. If you enjoyed what you heard, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. This podcast is on your favorite podcaster as well as YouTube. Tell your friends, join the Civil Gang, and help grow the Civil Gang. These episodes are only going to get wilder, they're only going to get crazier, and we're only going to figure more and more out about this complex world that is the Murrieta Territory. Next week, as always, we'll follow this up with a recap episode. Be sure to listen into those because not only are there Easter eggs on the chapters, but we get into some pretty interesting topics. And so far this season, it's gotten pretty colorful. And again, we're only going to keep getting more of that. But if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, if you like the story, the best way to support the podcast is to go buy the books. These are books available on Amazon in both ebook and paperback. Even if you prefer listening to the podcast over reading, definitely go buy the books if you'd like what you're like what you're hearing. They have very pretty covers. If they if you just want to look sophisticated and have them up on your bookshelf, you will impress your friends very much so, especially with these books. Each one features a different title color. It's very exciting. They they feature animals. Just just a beautiful sight to have up in your house and to look at and know that you're supporting art that you like. Because today, nowadays, it's very, very, it's as important as ever to support what you enjoy. So please do that. Also, if you have heard some of the episodes and you, this sounds interesting um, and you do like to read... The best way to not have to wait week after week for a new episode is to go ahead and buy the books. That way you can just read ahead. There have been four books released in the Civil Land series already, so you can get well ahead. There is one more left to be released that I am currently, that is my current work in progress. That book is called is going to be called Crevice Colossus. It's the final book in the Civil Land series, 
and it's going to be pretty intense. But until then, once again, all those books are available on Amazon. If you have already read them and you really, really enjoyed them, go ahead and give a review either on Amazon or Goodreads or both or somewhere else or if you just want to post it on social media. But if you could give it on Amazon, it helps with the algorithms. It would be much appreciated. And if you have feedback on the podcast, also go ahead and reach out on my contact form or social media. Let me know what you think. As I've said, the recap episodes have gotten colorful, so if you like what I'm saying or hate what I'm saying, either way, let me know. If you hate it, that's fine. Just don't listen and go away. Otherwise, next week I'll be back with the recap episode for this chapter. Until then, this has been Nicholas Austin. This is Tuesday Night Fiction, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Good night. The Tuesday Night Fiction podcast, the Civil Land series, and the musical score for the podcast are all produced by me.